Well, a very warm welcome to our press conference presenting this year's Financial Stability Review. Let me welcome Vice President Professor Dr. Claudia Buch and executive, and executive board member responsible for financial stability, among other things, including the macroprudential side, and Professor Dr. Joachim Wurmeling, who's responsible for banking and banking supervision, the microprudential side, that is. Ms. Buch is going to present the key statements of our financial stability review in a minute, and then we're looking forward to your questions. The press conference is streamed live on the internet, so all the content will be released immediately. Ms. Buch. A very warm welcome from me as well to this year's presentation of the Financial Stability Review. Now, it's very impressive to see that even the longest and most beautiful summer does have to come to an end. A clear sign it's November or a clear sign that our press conference is due. Economically speaking, however, times are still quite good. We've got a very robust economic growth still. Asset prices are high. There's hardly any volatility in the financial markets. Interest rates are also low. And comparing this to the previous year, we can say that expectations have been confirmed. And as far as the next year is concerned, we expect more or less positive growth, or largely positive growth. And the expectation is also that rates are going to go up slowly but surely. So isn't that anything new, you might ask, then? No news compared to last year? Well, there is something. In the financial system, with high growth rates and low rates, there are vulnerabilities. In the last reviews, we already mentioned that. Underestimating credit risk, overvaluation of assets and also loan collateral have to be mentioned here. For example, in the real estate market and, of course, the rate risk, the interest rate risk. These vulnerabilities have really increased in this year. There are first clouds already gathering on the horizon, which might really reveal these vulnerabilities. Different from last year, the downside risk is something that we see. We've got trade conflicts, I don't, I wouldn't have to mention this, you know it, but also geopolitical risks. Trade conflicts that would really hit the German economy hard if they escalate. And the United Kingdom, of course, leaving the EU, that's another matter. So downside risks have gone up, and should they actually materialize, we can say that the market corrections would also definitely expose the vulnerabilities in the financial system that we got. Now, globally speaking, there are also some vulnerabilities that have been developed. Debt is much higher today than it was 10 years ago, meaning that the capacity of governments to cushion a possible uh, downturn is limited. So in particular in these good times, we should use the opportunity to create resilience for bad times, like in the health system, or as in health it is. So we need to boost our immune systems before the flu season breaks out. Otherwise, it's too late. We all know it, but we don't always listen and observe these good advice. Now, concerning the financial markets, we can say that in good economy, economic times, risks of the future might be underestimated, the probability of some downturn, and provisions can often be neglected. Let me take a closer look at the economic situation as far as its relevant financial stability. The German economy is experiencing the longest period of expansion since the country's reunification. Now, this very good setting benefits private households. Households, So um, the economic situation, insolvencies have really been reduced. And this is a, a trend that could also see, be seen before the financial crisis. Household debt is at about 50% of the gross domestic product the lowest level in the past two decades. And of course, 
German companies have also started to profit from this. The number of insolvencies has dropped significantly. We mentioned this already last year. Capital's gone up from about 20% to 30% of uh, total assets. And uh, interest to be paid has become lower. These valuations are also reflected by the risk uh, assessments of the banks. However, first of all, let's take a look at the valuations in and of the markets, which definitely also reflect the good economic developments and the low interest rates. But again, you see the vulnerabilities in the financial system, because at present, prices are quite low when you look at historical averages, the mean since 2007. So risk prices or the, the premium, the price paid for risk is rather low. Real estate prices in Germany have also been rising steadily since the financial crisis, not just in the urban centers or, con or patients. According to Bundesbank estimates, real estate prices differ by about 15 to 30 percent from the level that will be justified by the fundamentals. So let's take a closer look at the vulnerabilities that I've mentioned, vulnerabilities of and in the German financial system. First of all, concerning the underestimation of credit risk. The good position and situation of companies is uh, reflected by low risk provisioning of the banks. This has led to a situation, co-contributed to the situation, where capital has gone up for the banks. The unweighted and the weighted uh, capital ratios have gone up, risk weighted that is, have gone up in the past year, significantly so, and the risk weighted equity ratio went up a bit more, and there's also a difference between larger banks and smaller banks. The unweighted equity ratio is uh, lower for the so-called systemically significant banks. So what about a potentially uh, future downturn of the economic cycle? The buffers in terms of equity would come under pressure because of uh, defaults and increasing risk weights, a trend that we could see in the past years, a decline of risk weights, could actually be reversed. And here you see it both for corporate loans and also retail business. Risk weights have gone down in both areas in the past years. Taking a closer look at the credit portfolios of the banks, then we see that uh, as a trend, we've had a shift of uh, credits or loans to companies that are a bit more vulnerable, high interest to be paid. So those companies that have to pay high interest. Now, uh, there is another uh, trend which might reverse if the situation deteriorates, is the fact that in the past two years, the relatively low volatility of the financial markets has led to an increase of equity of the banks. And when you look at this chart, you see the split. First of all, equity, and then the share that is due to value at risk for market risk provisions. This trend would actually reverse itself, it's a rather high share. So increasing volatility in the financial markets might be a burden for the banks. Vulnerability number two, the overvaluing of assets and loan collateral. This is closely connected to what I just mentioned here before. So let me use the example of residential real estate how we view this overvaluation of assets. The real estate market for residential housing, here the loan market is very relevant. It accounts for more than 50% of the total market of loans. And we have three indicators that we feel need to be considered. First of all, housing prices or residential real estate prices that continue to go up. But when you look at the second indicator, lending, when you look at that, you see that growth rates there are below average uh, compared to historical standards. And then credit or debt by households, that's also one criterion, this 
has developed uh, in a negative way, meaning it's been decli it's declined in the past years. So all in all, we see no need to activate any macroprudential instruments concerning specifically concerning the real estate market. However, we do keep watching this market very closely, and we must say, like in the past, we haven't got sufficient aggregate data, in particular when it comes to the granting of loans. And we also see that the danger of the over-evaluation of loan collateral is still there. We've done some stress tests looking at the real estate portfolios of banks and what would happen to them with a declining pricing scenario, with a deteriorating situation. So we've done that and we see that this would certainly affect the portfolios of the banks. The last of the three vulnerabilities is the interest rate risk as a result of maturity transformation. Now, in the past years, the share of long-term maturities, more than 10 years, has really gone up from 26% up to 45%. So if there were an abrupt uh, snapback of interest, the financing risks of banks would also go up. At the same time, however, interest income would come in only with a delay. So smaller banks, savings banks and corporate banks co would actually be uh, more affected than the, the smaller ones, Sparkassen and Genossenschaftsbanken, because they've got more maturity transformation. And because many banks will be affected at the same time, this effect could not be buffered by increasing new origination of loans. We have a situation, after all, that we look at where we had an economic downturn and all in all the demand for loans and credits would also decline, which means that a snapback in these interest rates, that this would not only be a risk to the financial situation, but the another scenario would also be long-term low interest rates. So interest rates staying, long, staying uh, low f for a long time then there is um, an incentive to take on risky exposures, and this will not just affect banks, but also insurers and uh, pension funds, etc. So they couldn't really compensate this effect. So what does all this mean, everything that I've described here from financial stability? At present, the downturn risks are stronger than anything else. The risks in the markets are probably underestimated, that's the trend, and probably the prices asked for the risks are too low. A more market downturn than expected and declining asset prices would then expose a number of different vulnerabilities. We have to be quite clear about this. Single or individual risks could be taken care of, but we are talking about a negative scenario where valuation risk, interest rate risks, and credit risks would all happen at the same time. And of course, they would reinforce themselves in the financial system. And I'd like to explain this by using this particular chart here. So what would happen if there were an economic decline, which were more market than presently expected? First of all, the capital ratio, equity ratios of banks would come under pressure. So depreciations, losses, and increasing risk weighting would be elements here. What could banks then do about their equity ratios, the equity ratios demanded by the supervisory authorities and the markets? One possibility would be to increase equity by using internal means retaining profits, not paying out dividends or lower dividends. But we are talking about a downswing in the economy with declining profits or even losses. So that would not be a viable solution for such a particular situation. A second possibility will be to take up capital in the market, but then in the short run in such a situation that wouldn't be possible with many banks opting for this possibility at the same time, that would be blocking it for everybody. And uh, with this unexpected strong economic downturn, there's only the third uh, possibility, which is really a, a shortening and uh, de-risking of the balance sheets. It would have a negative effect on the loans and credits, and then also had some feedback on the overall uh, 
the overall situation. So this would be contagion, a contagious effect that would reinforce the downturn. If this effect is going to happen, how strong it's going to be, this really very much depends on the buffers in the system concerning losses. So it is something positive that banks since the financial crisis worldwide have really increased their equity ratios. Many micro prudential, prudential measures, but also the uh, macro prudential buffers asked for systemically relevant or significant banks have contributed to this. These vulnerabilities mentioned by me, however, are not limited to individual banks. They do affect the entire system, meaning if many players in the market are too optimistic in good times and react in the same way in a possible downturn scenario, this might actually reinforce the effects on the financial system. Individual players would actually act in a risk-conscious way, but this might lead to a situation for the entire system that there were no that, that the buffers are not uh, sufficient anymore and the effects are not taken care of sufficiently. So it is the macroprudential objective to rec recognize such dangers for the system early on, act early on also in order to protect the functioning of the financial system. And we believe that in terms of macroprudential activities, there is need to act. I'd like to explain this a bit more in detail. First of all, it's for each and every individual market participant. They all need to build up sufficient resilience when it comes to unexpected or bad times. So risk management comes in here. Financing decisions that are taken, whenever this happens, these potential scenarios that might lead to high losses also have to be looked at. Now, looking at the latest news, this means, of course, also that we have to look at the possibility of a hard Brexit, which is not fully excluded. Cyclical risks, we mentioned those before, they really require preventive actions. So buffers should be established in good times already concerning economic risks that can then be reduced and uh, used in bad times to avoid contagion. Macroprudential instruments, we got them. We've got a whole toolkit or spectrum, warnings and recommendations, but also macroprudential capital buffers data, I mentioned this before, uh, we've mentioned it a number of times, as you remember, at similar occasions. In Germany, the data situation is still very good when it comes to residential real estate, in particular, in view of financing conditions. So in conclusion, I can say that uh, the present favorable economic situation offers a very good opportunity to bolster balance sheets in order to build up resilience for rainy days. That's my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention, and we are looking forward to your questions. Well, that was short and sweet. Ms. Schäle. Well, one thing about data and also housing real estate, it says that Germany is among the last ones in the European market. Could you tell us what the gold standard is? In other words, what you would need that other countries have? My second question is this. I'm wondering, this on pages 85 and the following of report of the, rep the review, you're mentioning the stress tests and the extremely adverse scenario, the CT1 ratio of banks using internal models could go down below 4%. And now I'm wondering, after everything you said, what about the capital adequacy requirements? Are they any good for good weather conditions? Good in good times, and shouldn't you really look for a higher unweighted capital ratio for banks? Thank you for that question. First of all, about your question on data. Now, I'd hesitate to point at one particular country as exemplary. The point is really this. It's not 
that we don't know anything about the real estate market at all. We know a lot on loans on an aggregate basis, can look at the balance sheets of banks and their usual statistical information and looking at the data on an aggregate level. But on a more systematic level, we don't really know a lot about credit or lending standards, which are the things that we are talking about when talking about housing finance and financial market stability. And a lot has to do with the lending standards, the LTVs, loan to value, debt levels or indebtedness of borrowers. And there we don't have disaggregated data, in other words, systematic data. So in order to be able to assess whether any risk is building up for financial stability, we would need to know more on the lending standards. And we need to know that on a much more granular or disaggregated level. As you've also seen, we have housing as part of the indicators on our website, but that is based on private sector data, more or less, which is good and serves its purpose. But, but when looking at supervision, banking supervision, we need a much sounder and more complete database that we can use for our assessment of the risks. Now for your question on the stress tests, and I think when it comes to banks, banking supervision and the regulatory environment of banks, Mr. Vermeling can certainly say a lot more on this. But let me say this, I'm not really sure which statement exactly you're referring to in the report, but when it comes to the stress test, we're looking at the EBA stress test right, right now most recent one, which first of all is taken from a microprudential view where perhaps the media descriptions were also a little distorted. Ma Macroprudential and microprudential is not a contradiction. I read somewhere that you have to opt for one of the two, micro or macroprudential. No, but it's mutually complementary. Microprudential supervision and its purpose is to look at the specific bank how it would fare in a stress test scenario and look at their specific models and so on. The objective of macroprudential supervision is look at potential contagion effects in the system. In other words, really taking the macroeconomic perspective if you want. What we are looking at right now is the question of what it would look like in terms of economic and economic cycle risks, how they are reflected in the bank's model. So that's what we are looking at and have been looking at specifically. Not uh, the question whether the models are good or not. I think they play a very important role also for micro prudential, but the potential contagion effect from that in a downturn scenario that is more severe than anticipated. And there we do see some risk of that happening. Yes, thank you for allowing me to answer as well. well. I think the question was really geared towards a potential underestimating of risks for banks that are not applying internal models, where you're asking whether the, those models are really legitimate, if that was your question. The answer to that would be this. Internal models are indeed based on the idea that, in retrospect, you are looking at a particular period and derive the probability of these risks materializing in the future as well. And indeed, if you look at this reference period, which usually is five to seven years, and if during that period you have an economic expansion as well, on an ongoing basis, then structurally the risk would be reducing over that period. And that's why the extrapolation for that period into the future is actually more positive and would be because that's also mandatory under the internal models that a downturn would have to be taken into account as well. In banking supervision, we undertake major efforts to make sure that the underestimation of risks in internal models is counterweighted. When you look at the entire SSM level, there's one exercise that we did where all internal models are investigated when it comes to that uh, risk. I'm very grateful to you, the trim exercise. I'm very grateful 
to my colleague for having pointed out the difference between macro and microprudential supervision, especially on slide 17. We're looking at resilient banks, and the fact that we have them simply doesn't preclude any risks to financial stability from the macroprudential view. And that's exactly the situation that we're in today. We are working on strengthening the resilience of banks, and I think during the last 10 years or so, major progress has been made and major achievements. Incidentally, the increasing strengthening of capital buffers under Basel III is happening, and we are strengthening the capital base. The exercise that I've mentioned, but also the stress tests that you've been referring to in your, qu in your question, but also the deleveraging, which is also continuing. All in all, we can say that when it comes to future stress, we can be a little more relaxed, perhaps, than in the past. But of course, this doesn't mean that this risk has gone away entirely. And that leads to our ongoing duty in this, as you have also pointed out, in fact, and more specifically the duty of everything in the financial sector, mainly the banks, to not relent in their efforts in strengthening financial soundness. Another part of that is building higher capital buffers as well. And banks in Germany have this problem of a weaker earnings situation or earnings power, which is a limit, which limits their capacity of building these buffers. Still, we find that banks are trying to. And we are observing it with everything we can to make sure that interest ri risk, market risks, and all the risks that we've mentioned are not underestimated. Mr. Otto from ZFGK. Thank you. I have three questions, in fact. Could you clarify the underestimating of credit risks a little? There are so many subjunctives, could, might, if, etc. Could you be more specific in terms of the basis that you're using for, to say that banks are underestimating the risks? Yes, risk weights have gone up, but they're still on a low level when I look at that chart and that this was widening when it comes to companies having l less equity, it doesn't really mean that they are at a risk, a higher risk of default. So could you help me interpret this information? Second question, banks and their equity or capital base, Mr. Vermeling, retaining earnings you can't do in a downturn, uh, compensating for losses in the capital market, can't do that either if all come at the same time, and deleveraging and other means, no, because it would exacerbate the downturn. But what would be your recommendation? What should banks do, especially from the supervisor's perspective? Question three, the contradiction in recent days, supervision that really bites whenever necessary, which is something that has been mentioned by the Bundesbank as well, and still emphasizing that regulation is important on the one hand, but there shouldn't be excessive regulation. What about that contradiction? Could you help me on that? Thank you for these questions, a whole range of questions, and that gives me the opportunity to shed some more light on one or the other thing. Underestimating credit risk. That comes in two dimensions, really, and Mr. Vermeling has really explained that, and both quite well. One thing is the predictive power based on the past looking into the future. And that is something which is relevant for all of us and all the things. And the example of the long summer is something that I started with to illustrate things where you might forget that it will be gray and foggy, just like right now. But on a more fundamental basis, the problem comes up in many economic situations and interlinkages. All valuations and estimations are down or due to the low interest rates, wherever the balanced rate or natural rate might be, which means that loans are very cheap, and that's reflected in valuations and estimations as well. So the question of whether we'll really be able to extrapolate the positive economic development of the past is something that we have to look at, and we have higher insecurity and uncertainty that we have to look at.
Second point, and coming back to one of the charts, we have to look at what's happening in the entire system. And you can have feedback loops that can happen from that because the risk management of every single mar market participant cannot really be mapped properly. So it's two things, the predictive power and what's really happening in the system. You, our recommendation to the banks, what will the financial system overall need to be stable and be stable through a cyclical downturn as well? Well, what is needed is sufficient buffers that you can then utilize in a potential downturn to also reduce the contagion effects as well. But again, Mr. Vermeling can perhaps say more on that. Let me simply say one or two things in answering your question. What do all these, these things that we mean, that we present, mean for regulation in a forward-looking perspective? Because this keeps being adapted and also the discussion is also ongoing when it comes to major packages of regulation that are completed, that means that new things aren't specific yet, when the old things aren't fully implemented yet. And we're looking at financial stability. We also have to look at risks potentially migrating within the financial sector. This means observing risks on the one hand, on the other hand, identifying things where action is needed. In retrospect, the reforms that have been completed are associated with a very complex process on the level of G20 and the Financial Stability Board more specifically, which provides a framework to assess and evaluate reforms. It's a framework that's been applied. I think last year we reported on the framework, but no specific examples yet, but now we have them. And I think this is a very good and structured process in order to deal with these many different issues that are connected to regulation. That should allow us to say that, yes, there are specific market participants that have an interest in either strengthened or weakened regulation, as the case may be. On the other hand, we have an overall economic perspective as well. I think this is reflected very well. Okay, let me only briefly add to the answer. To be very clear, Mr. Otto, there is no intention whatsoever to lower the standards of regulation. However, there is a history of this that after the financial market crisis, the regulation looked at large systemically important institutions, the G20 agreements, and then that uh, came in through European regulation when it comes to our financial sector. And that's applied to even the small and medium-sized banks, where it doesn't make a lot of sense quite often. And that's also the, the object and purpose of the monitoring based on the Basel Committee process, but also the European Union and Germany. And we, Deutsche Bundesbank, also contributed very specific proposals to that debate when it comes to lowering the reporting standards for small and medium-sized undertakings, which is being finalized by the Brussels, the European legislator, and this has been a fast success. Very briefly on credit standards or lending standards, what we find is that the uh, lending standard slash GDP ratio is closing, or that gap is closing by and large. And when it comes to the deposit surplus, there is a lot of temptation to lower lending standards. And in the bank lending survey responses, we've seen that, at least some of that, asset prices that are exaggerated based on the very expansionary monetary policy. And that means to an overestimation or overvaluation of collateral, of course. So those are some of the influencing factors. And indeed, it's true that in a crisis, you have two ways out for a bank, as Ms. Bucha said, deleveraging on the one hand and building capital on the other. And it's not so easy in Germany. And that is why this has been our recommendation and conclusion, that during times where things are going well, you should build up buffers to be able to use them in such a, such a situation so that you don't have to resort to limiting your business activity, which would lead to this downward spiral, as Ms. Buch has explained, which w might lead to financial stability risks in the end. N next on the growing list, Nida uh, Lutmar from Frankfurt Rundschau. 
a number of questions. First of all, now look, looking at the, the review, reading it, the feeling is that 50% of it is residential loans, housing loans. And as a lay person, when you read this, it seems that there are quite, quite substantial risks accumulating the way you put it. And when you then say on page 58, and you mentioned this, that there is no real reason for action, for taking action, I don't understand this. So half of this review was all about residential real estate risks, and then you say nothing needs to be done there. So the question that I ask really is what would have to happen in order for you to take action? That's one question. The second question on supervisory measures. Have I understood it correctly that you do demand anti-cyclical buffers, buffers to be instituted? You say there is need for action, and that's not just asking the banks to please think about matters. I suppose that the supervisory agencies will also want to do something. Many countries have these buffers. Maybe you can say something about that. And another brief question concerning the data situation. Now, you've been asking this for quite some years. We need better data. You need better data. What's the answer? What about uh, politics? Why isn't it done? After all, politicians and everybody keeps saying that everything needs to be done in order to make the financial system more stable or secure. Why aren't things done then? Now, and then the very direct questions. Are you relaxed or are you worried concerning the financial system? Well, thank you. I'm going to combine the answer to the first and to the third question, because it belongs together, really. So first of all, 50% of the report or review on residential housing, it's not really the case. But of course, it is an important topic. That's why there is quite a bit of room given to it. So look at uh, TV programs and, and public perception. Residential real estate comes up time and again. It's very important, not just in terms of financial stability, and I think that here, better data would be helpful in many other areas as well. But now, for the time being, we are talking about financial stability and what exactly do we know concerning important uh, indicators like debt and the granting of loans. It's a bundle of indicators that we look up at when we want to assess financial stability and the risks that are caused by residential real estate. Price is going up alone. If this is driven by high equity financing of the investors, that can be very painful for individual investors that actually took a wrong term. But for financial stability, it wouldn't be that important because there wouldn't be the contagion for the financial system that we see in other scenarios. So the, the hurdle to institute or start very rigid macroeconomic instruments is very high. When you look at other countries, what they do, so LTVs are limited. How much can I actually take up as a loan for a piece of real estate? They look at income situations of private households. So these are demand side instruments, instituting these high hurdles, or the, there are high hurdles before they're instituted. And that's got to do with the data situation. Aggregated information is what we got, but we have not a lot in terms of disaggregated or granular information. So what would happen, for example, what would happen if such a demand-side instrument would be instituted? We haven't got enough information on that. The overall aggregate picture looks as follows. Prices are going up, but the lending doesn't follow with the same dynamic uh, pace. So there is not much of a dynamic development there also when you look at the debt situation of households. The other side, the other thing, cyclical risks, I mentioned that as well. Overpricing or overvaluation, this is also connected closely to what we've discussed. Creating sufficient buffers on the supply side, for example. So those for those who, who do real estate financing, this will also have an effect here. As far as the real estate market, we don't see that there is need for action, but when we look at the general situation of cyclical risks there, it's different. 
So it's not that we just wrote this and said we don't need to do anything, so we do make this distinction here. But you have to look at the overall picture. Anti-cyclical capital buffers. As far as that is concerned, yes, we keep discussing it. I mentioned that the macroprudential need for action covers a whole spectrum of instruments, or can do that at least. We are discussing these matters. And we also assess the situation. When you look at the communication that we got here, it's a soft measure already. So as far as that is concerned, to answer your last question again, we are not completely relaxed. No, we are not. In particular, when it comes to this topic, we are not. Because we do see that there are cyclical risks that uh, have started to build up in the financial system. There is nothing to add here, but maybe very briefly concerning this remark, but you are not doing anything. As far as banking supervision is concerned, this is definitely not the case. On the contrary, we do quite a bit. I mentioned things, deleveraging, increasing capital, improving risk management. So at present, we do focus on microprudential activities of supervision. You mentioned both, and you mentioned macroprudential prudential action as well. But when we ask everybody here to establish buffers, acting preventively, then this is very clear. It's a clear requirement. It's exactly what uh, we've also been asking with the counter or anti-cyclical capital buffer. These buffers are to be established in good times in order to be used in bad times later. So they can then be depleted. So we need this, this knowledge that we have to have buffers. So we are not worried, nor are we relaxed. We are prepared for everything. And we started to appeal to everybody to also be prepared for everything. One more sentence, if I may, concerning the anti-cyclical capital buffers. If you look at that, you mentioned the other countries in the report, in the review, it's also mentioned. So we've got two components, first of all. There's a rule-based component, and there is some latitude, arbitrary action. And it's quite interesting to look at other countries and how they reason, because it's based on rules and clearly structured. It can be difficult or is difficult at times when you get different risk situations to just apply hard rules. That's interesting to see here. So all of the analysis that we've done and keep doing are very important by way of an input. So the macroprudential work is based on good microprudential jobs done. And then, of course, we also get feedback into the microprudential supervisory area from the macroprudential side. At present, I see it like this. Of course, in the Financial Stability Committee, we do discuss these matters, and with the colleagues involved there, there is a great deal of willingness pr to proceed. And you could take it from the press. Mr. Hufeld also commented on that. We need to do something. Everybody was quite clear about this, and we had a discussion before. There was the AFS recommendation, the Committee for Financial Stability, to use macroprudential instruments, create them for the real estate market and also a sufficient databases. Two of the four instruments have been created by the legislator. The data part's been postponed for the time being, one reason being that in particular when it was uh, personal data on private households, debt ratios, etc., there is a particular sensitivity that needs to be applied. But we've started to tackle this in a very structured way. So data privacy, data protection, very sensitive information is what we have here. And then, of course, we also have to look at the cost when it comes to providing these data. But discussions have progressed in a very positive way, and we are going to make some, some progress in general. Mr. Neubacher, Börsenzeitung. Well, first of all, I noticed that you seem to be worried about the pro-cyclical a trend, and there might be some fear, if I understood you correctly, that this might be detrimental in the long run. So what about uh, supervisory standards? Aren't they bad? Basel II introduced pro-cyclical tools or instruments at the beginning of next year. 
we are going to have IFRS 9 for the first time, and it's also some criticism that we have heard about pro-cyclicality, so one might get nervous. What's your take on that? Might there be a problem of the supervisory standards? Now, you could even go further and say macroprudential supervision. Is that supposed to repair what's been done wrong in microprudential areas by Basel or whoever is in charge of that? Because that's not all that old macroprudential and microprudential supervision. That's one thing. Second, what about uh, residential real estate again? I've understood now that you asked for better data. Mr. Hofeld announced this, that there is going to be uh, a query about that. Anything else that you'd like to see in terms of measures or adopt? So capitals, capital uh, buffers are to be established by banks. That's your appeal. But wh what else? Are you waiting for the new reporting format? Are you going to look at real estate data then in order to take some further decisions? Or is there anything in the pipeline already? I'll start with the lending standards. Are they bad? Now, we mentioned this before, a supervisory standards it is. It's not about uh, criticizing neither the supervisory activities nor the internal models of the banks. They've all got their functions, their objectives and targets. Microprudential supervision. It's very differentiated, and what this is all about is really to look at the liquidity situations or the solvencies of the different banks, the separate banks, the individual ones. Financial Finance business is a very complex one, and so regulation must also be very complex to mirror that. And it's not uh, that the macro prudential supervision is all about repairing that, making up for the mistakes of uh, micro prudential work. It's a completely different view. It's looking at the entire financial system. Macroprudential supervision is not supervision of the banks. Now, we, we've focused on banks for time reasons here, so maybe we've lost sight also of the report, also looking at pension funds, insurances, the international global situation. So it's, it's about everything and how everything placed together in the financial system. Are there other things, for example, in the financial system that might buffer certain risks? The risks that we've identified, we don't see this at present. We see many parts of the financial system that uh, are really exposed to risks in a similar way. So it's not a contradiction or opposites. It's one adding to the other. And of course, they both are necessary, and they're part of the Basel system of regulation. Since the crisis, we've had a very positive economic situation, so many of the measures haven't been tested yet, and that's what the Global Financial Stability Report of the IMF states, so that's why we keep looking at these matters. Data, that's the third point. As far as real estate is concerned, it's not that we're all waiting for the data to come to us. We do regular monitoring with the information that we got. We carry out our analyses concerning financial stability, and you also find this information, macroprudential stress testing of the banks are part of this. You find this in the review. And I have to repeat what I said before. We see certain indicators that indicate stronger risks or more market risk, others do not do that. So we keep watching this and we keep monitoring the situation. Philip Plickert from FAZ. Yes, a question to you, Ms. Buch. In recent years, you uh, looked at the overpricing of housing real estate and compared it to what you saw as reasonably in line with fundamentals. And I think I remember it was 15% overpricing, and then it w th a few years ago, then 30, and now 15 to 30. Does it mean that your concern has lessened a little because the range has become quite wide that you're suggesting now? Because in recent years, prices have gone up clearly, have been risen, have been rising more dynamically than the fundamentals would warrant. So overpricing would actually have to be more severe, but according to your cautious estimate, it hasn't. So have you gone down with your level of concern? <laughs> 
No. What it really is, is a relatively constant picture that emerges. And also the discussion that we've just had on indicators that is similar. Let me briefly come back to the fundamentals that become part of the analysis and assessment. It's fundamentally about the question of demography and how it develops, re the regional economies, because it's also regionally disaggregate, disaggregated models, the price for housing, for housing real estate. So that those are factors that feed in, and that leads to the range of overvaluation, overpricing relative to fundamentals. And there hasn't been a major underlying shift when it comes to these changes and how the indicators are developed. So the underlying story is quite similar with some detail here and there, but the fundamental picture hasn't changed. All right, Saskia Lippmann from Wirtschaftswoche. Well, I have a question where I'd ask you to be more specific on the underestimating of credit risks. The risk provisioning level that we have or that you see right now, is that sufficient or hasn't enough been done in that arena? My other question is about the buffer to be developed by the banks. You're saying that they should build capital buffers or should be doing that now. But isn't it really too late? Shouldn't they have been doing that in the past? And related to that, have they done enough? Then I have a more general question. To what extent are you concerned about Italy right now and developments there, specifically in the banking sector, but also the financial sector in general? Thank you. Let me ask, answer your question about risk provisioning. Risk provisioning is a process, a thing that happens when a certain loan is in distress or nearing a situation of default where you have a specific event triggering that. So risk provisioning here is something that we don't mean provisioning for a rainy day in a general sense, but actual provision set aside when a loan is uh, non-performing or in a certain reaches a certain risk level. It's really not our prerogative to judge provisioning in any other way. But when we say provisioning, it's an event triggered by the le or as agreed in the lending standard. We also see that buffers have been built, coming to your other question, beyond the legal requirements, in fact. And we, can, we also have the respective accounting rules applying that. What we believe, and that's our key statement and conclusion today, the resilience to bad times could and should be reinforced even more by building up more capital buffers. Banking supervision is, of course, cyclical in the sense that if the weather turns, we couldn't just say, OK, let's lower capital adequacy rules now. That would be counterproductive or counterfactual. And that leads me to the second conclusion and statement. You need preventive act action to uh, defend yourself against cyclical risks. And Italy, yes. And also the buffers. I'll try to answer that. It's really the nature of financial stability reviews that we are saying, what if a negative scenario happens? But first of all, you have to look at the baseline as it is now, the baseline scenario. And that is still an economic situation that is intact, to call it that. But as I said, this is the time to build sufficient buffers and to strengthen the resilience, the immune system of the financial system. This is a good time. So I'd really see it as being too late, but simply saying we have to use these good times. And that's not only true for Germany, but the financial sector and banking sector in other countries as well. The International Monetary Fund also said so in their stability review. As for Italy, I'd be lying 
if I said that we're not observing the situation very actively, in fact, which is what we do. Of course, it has some political dimensions as well that I wouldn't want to discuss here. What I would say about Italy is this. Italy shows that we have a lot of uncertainty, including political uncertainty, that we have to protect ourselves against situations where risks could materialize, I mean. What we've seen so far in markets is corrections, yes, when it comes to prices as well, or specifically the spreads for Italy. So far, we haven't seen any major contagion effects, which is always a question that we'll have to ask. Are there any contagion effects? So there is market di discipline, which is effective, and no strong contagion effects. Looking ahead, and the other question was about regulation and the current state of affairs. It's not something that we are discussing urgently right now, but as part of the regulation agenda for the future, we have to look at the question of sovereign risks and how it's taken care of in the balance sheets of, uh, of banks. The bank's sovereign nexus that's often referred to is something that you can see when looking at Italy. But it's something that we should discuss um, in a very quiet way, and it's not really urgent and immediate on our agenda. Question from Dow Jones next. Ms. Bourg, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question as to what uh, my colleague from the Frankfurt Rundschau has asked. The counter-cyclical uh, reserves are buffers, and I think the threshold or obstacle is high. Well, I think I heard that, and you said that you don't have disaggregate data. And that answer really related to potential counter-cyclical buffers for banks? Did I get that right? Well, I'm sorry if I perhaps talked about two things at the same time and didn't make the difference sufficiently clear. When it comes to the level, the amount, and that's true for every regulation, really, when regulation and before regulation kicks in, we have to do thorough analysis and look at the potential impact, and that's true for all measures. What I was talking about specifically here was those measures on the demand side for loans. And these are things, well, how can I put it, things that we didn't have available yet. So specifically, when looking at uh, uh, housing loan transaction, limiting the LTVs, for example, or changing the limit, looking at the loans and relating them to the value of the real estate, the loan-to-value ratio, and also repayment uh, questions. So those are two in instruments that would be available for the housing finance market specifically, where we are saying that at the moment we don't see any immediate need of, of to think about that. So that's data. When it comes to the counter-cyclical data buffer, uh, Capital buffers for the banks, that's different. It's about banks where the data situation is different and also the underlying analyses are a little different com compared to these uh, quotation mark new instruments. Yes, exactly, as you're saying. This is a discussion that is taking place internationally as well. It's talked about a lot internationally, the counter-cyclical capital buffers, and is it now time to apply it or not? It's an international and specifically European discussion as well. Well, there's discretion in that as well, but there's also a clear indicator, and that's the credit GDP gap, and that's something that can be calculated. You asked the banks to do more about provisioning and maybe also establish further capital buffers. My first question on that, are you talking about the stock-listed banks, the big ones or the smaller ones? How would you say it? Where's the biggest need in the banking system in general? And the second question again on residential real estate, 15 to 30 percent, you say, for cities. And you also relate this to the debt situation of households, and you don't think there's 
any reason for alarm, at least not a lot, a lot of alarm. So when would you actually say, now it's time to set the alarm or strike the alarm? And what kind of ratio would you see with the debt situation of households? The first question, who has bigger need? Bigger or larger, uh, larger or, or smaller banks concerning countercyclical risks? I wouldn't really want to establish a ranking here. I wouldn't want to say that for the bigger banks it's less or more violent than for the smaller ones. Looking at the cyclical risks, I think they come in different shapes. Whether you look at smaller, bigger banks, now the interest rate risk, that's one facet of the macroeconomic or cyclical risks. Here, the small and medium-sized banks in Germany will be more exposed to these risks. And there are many together that suffer from these vulnerabilities. Other banks have got different areas of interest, credit risk and the situation there. We talked about that before. So I wouldn't be able to, to set up some priorities could be more affected. All in all, we have a system where the cyclical risks, the macroeconomic risks, can build up, do build up, and that just affects a larger part of the banking system in general. Then the threshold of for action. So if our economists had said, let's say, 20 to 40 percent, what we then have to say at long last, now the time has come, we have to do something. Now, we had this counter-cyclical capital buffer discussion. There is the attempt to establish a threshold, but still there is some latitude and some room for arbitra arbitration or arbitrarily taking a decision. So I wouldn't say that here in this situation we have a clear threshold and the warning signs go on. Once the threshold is exceeded, we see many indicators that we take, and then, of course, we try to make an assessment based on some certain quantitative models as well. So certain deteriorations of the general conditions, how would this, that affect banks? But there, there's always going to be some latitude, some discretion, and that makes sense, I'd say. Now, if you want to take a look, there are indicators that we do list concerning early warning thresholds. There is a box in the review describing these early warning indicators. And there you see that real estate prices looking forward do issue warning prices. For Germany, it's buffered a bit because we've got a high surplus of the current account. So we've got the two effects here, real estate prices and the current account surplus. but. Looking into the future, it might also turn into a risk if, as I said before, the trade conflicts escalated any further. So there are always different indicators that we have to look at, and it's not possible just to look at one of them. We have to look at the full picture. Okay. Uh, after the stress test, Luis de Gundos mentioned 9% is equity ratio. Uh, what, how do you feel about this? 9% equity ratio? Is that his uh, personal opinion? Or is it really something that everybody ought to adhere to? I, I, I haven't heard it. He was here yesterday, and he must have proposed it elsewhere. So I can't really comment on that for that reason. So the system of assessing capital requirements, equity requirements, is a very differentiated one. We've got the Basel minimum requirements or standards that specify them quite clearly. And it's been adjusted at European and German level. All of the buffers are used here. So we've got uh, systemically relevant and other relevant buffers that come in here. So I don't really see any reasons to call these rules into doubt or question. And Mr. De Guinness, I don't think he wanted to do that. One would have to know what exactly or when exactly he mentioned these 9%. Maybe somebody else can help me out here with the 9 percent. Would that be the ratio that 
will be the, the minimum under stress test scenarios. That's what he meant. OK, that's what he meant. So I can say very clearly that we decided quite intentionally for stress test scenario not to specify any failure rates or ratios, because in the meantime, we've got the SREP instruments, so which is a capital add-up concerning uh, addition concerning the specific risk situation of a bank, and this is what we use for the stress test, and that's the supervisory consequence of the stress test. And at present, that is what we feel makes sense in this particular case. Nicholas Comfort, Bloomberg. I'm the only Brit here in the room, so I'd like to ask a question about Brexit, if I may. There are financial stability risks entailed by a hard uh, Brexit. Ms. May will actually introduce or present the plan with, to, the, to her cabinet. So what we've read, at least. Now, financial risks or stability risks, what's your biggest worry there? The Commission, we heard yesterday from the Commission that there's going to be equivalence or might be equivalence for clearing houses from England, from the UK, that this might happen very quickly. Is that over and done with then? And the sovereign risk waiting for third countries, is that maybe something that you worry about? What about the items or points where you feel that more preparation is necessary. Contra continuity, Mr. Cook has mentioned this, that there is going to be some fix. In the past months, the statements were a bit different. It was actually stated that it was a problem for industry, that industry needed to solve. So what are you particularly worried about? Maybe you can give us a, your take on that. I can be brief in answering the question. Maybe in two general terms concerning what you expect. What I'm most worried about is that the market participants are not properly prepared and everybody still keeps hoping that everything will be settled politically. That's another example of the uncertainties that we have here. Now, we got this report or the statement from last night and maybe everybody's a bit more optimistic that we are not going to have a hard Brexit. We're not involved in these negotiations, so there is nothing I can really say about this. But everybody keeps watching very closely what is happening. And of course, the Commission has also done this, also offering some advice. Every single one ought to look at their risks and business models and then be prepared for the potential risk of a hard Brexit. There can be different things. So it doesn't make sense here to go into detail to think about the most important measures that might have to be adopted or what kind of calculations one might have to do. Now, but the overall picture is everybody seems to think that things are going to turn out well. Regulation is going to be adjusted. That can be a risk. Now, if everybody really prepares with the right amount of vision and prudence, there might be short-term distortions in the market, but then it's going to be improbable that there are going to be major risks for financial stability. From the supervisory point of view, well, the internationally uh, active uh, acting uh, banks have taken preparations for a hard Brexit in the meantime. There might be some places, of course, where we are going to see some stumbling blocks. Anyway, we don't believe that there are going to be any major problems endangering the financial system as a whole. All of the financial products offered in the UK are also available on the continent. Maybe not with the same level of liquidity at the same prices, but still, even in the case of a hard Brexit, we don't see any major dangers, real dangers for financial stability. Indeed, we've kept saying that when it comes to solving the challenges, the banks, the institutes are called on. They have to prepare well for everything. But it might also be possible that some sovereign measures might be taken in order to reduce risks. We as Deutsche Bundesbank would certainly support this. They must only be temporary, temporary measures, not uh, leading to the continued existence of a financial passport for the UK with a limited membership. 
What about licensing? Well, the answer to that is no. It's a question of, well, legal engineering, if you want, or jurisdiction. You could, of course, go, go through product by product and directive by directive and regulation by that regulation to take certain temporary measures. However, allowing something across the board in terms of a full guarantee of the financial passport beyond the exit point and exit time, that's something that we don't see. All right, Mr. Marlene Handelsblatt. I have two questions. First of all, the interest rate risk, where you looked at the risks for the savings bank or Sparkassen and the cooperative bank sector, are they your main concern when it comes to that risk? Or did you look at life insurances as a sector as well, and perhaps others, and how they might be affected? My second question is about chart two. That's consumer insolvencies. You said that the economic situation is on a historic, historically high level, and you can also see that when looking at the low insolvency r rates or numbers, especially looking at the corporate sectors where I guess consumer insolvencies might not be so relevant for the lending market, loans, or are they? Uh, thank you very much for that question. We spoke briefly about whether that is irrelevant for part of the risk that we are discussing, or does it go beyond that to affect the whole system and its risk? Interest rate risks is a particular risk for the smaller and medium-sized banks, was our conclusion. And when you look at the Basel interest rate shock scenario and how strongly affected banks would be if rates were to change, then you can see that structurally the savings banks and cooperative banks as a sector have a higher risk from that, which is part of the nature of their business. On the other hand, insurance companies and also pension funds and organizations are also the subject of a separate extensive chapter in the review. We also said last year that the likelihood is low, admittedly, but we are also talking about scenarios at a uh, low probability risk that where there if there was an abrupt raising of rates, then life insurances would be affected, and there is a critical rate where it's worth giving back your policy, essentially, selling it back to the insurer, and what happens then? So that is a risk that cannot be ruled out 100%. And it's across all investors that we are looking at the point that whenever interest rates change, then the valuations also change quickly with them. So that's also an aspect of macroeconomic risk that we have. And that would also lead to revaluation of assets across the sector, not even isolated or looking at that group in isolation. I think just to assess the whole picture, it's interesting to show that. Coming back to consumer insolvencies, their number is declining. At the beginning, there was a slide where I showed you this. And essentially, when it comes to the solvency or the debt sustainability of private household, that is essential. Because when you look at financial institutions, then they grant housing loans, and housing loans account for a major share of lending, about 50% of the lending volume, in fact, especially for the smaller banks where the market share has moved again. In other words, that number is relevant for the situation of private households. Mr. Malen, I could also contribute to that and remind you that we checked that or tested that in the survey as well, the extent to which the 30 basis point Basel shock was something that they could survive. And the, that will also be repeated as part of the bank survey next year to see the sensitivity there. OK, any final questions? Well, I do have a question about the chart. 
The peculiar thing is that in the early 2000s, you, you could look at the unemployment level and the number of insolvencies that was quite different from today. I'm a little surprised about that. Do you have any explanation? Well, off the cuff, it's difficult to say. There are many, many different factors contributing towards consumer insolvencies, not only unemployment, but also income and uh, interest payable. We'd have to look at several factors. Yes, I think that spread has quite a number of reasons and different reasons. But you're right, this could be misleading if you look at those countering trends, but the reasons are different. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bu. Mr. Wimmerling, any concluding remarks? Well, not really. Perhaps simply thank you for all the questions that are always very helpful for our work as well, helping us in our reflections and also how to optimize our presentation. And we're always happy to receive your feedback, even more so because we have the teams, the, the author team of the review here. Thank you for your work as well. So the discussion is always interesting. Thank you. Thank you from me. And enjoy the second half of the Eurofinance week. And have a nice day.